you know, it's uh, it'll be fascinating to kind of see that part evolve because, like, as other ETFs or crypto come on, like how that shifts the market. Do you see yeah. a drawdown in Bitcoin because you want to go to the Ethereum or XYZ one that comes right. along? Um, uh, I, time I, will I tell. totally see in the future there's going to be ETF that has like market cap weighted coins, as there it. should yeah. be. Yeah. yeah, Wisdom Tree. I don't know if they have a trademark on it, but they already have an index that does yeah. that. There should be an SPY of crypto. Yes, um, <laughs> but we're so far away from that right yeah. now. <laughs> Correct. It's not even fun to think about. Well, we right. need the SEC to finish their version of cleaning house uh, yes. and once they're done doing that <laughs> right. it'll be safe to do that welcome to a wiser retirement podcast where we believe the best financial advice should always be conflict free i'm your host casey smith guiding you to financial freedom today are my co-hosts andrew pratt and robert Sorthout. uh andrew is the investment manager at wiser wealth management we call him the king of data and robert is the founder and ceo of uh, portfolio manager at Teton Crypto Capital. Hey guys. Good morning, Casey. Good morning. So I broke out my hat today. Yes. I think it's the first <laughs> time I've worn this outside my office and I only wear it in my office briefly. Yes. But um, it was an award that I got as our firm passed to a certain threshold sure. in assets management. Yeah. <laughs> and the team surprised me with this this I'm um, yeah. wearing this gold hat with a big dollar. There's lots of it. listeners, not many viewers. So we <laughs> right. really need to describe this thing. <laughs> you can see this on uh, the YouTube, YouTube channel. channel. Yes. Right. Yeah. Maybe that's the draw to go look on <laughs> <Yeah>. YouTube. <laughs> a wiser retirement YouTube. You can see my uh, gold hat with a big dollar sign on it. Yep. Um, so anyway, today we're going to talk about alternative asset classes. Uh, and should you be invested in them? Uh, as we get started, I will uh, congratulate Andrew on completing a uh, new designation, uh, the CBDA. That's right. <laughs> More uh, alphabet soup after your. <laughs> yes. We yeah. had to get. We I had think to, they all have a C and an A somewhere. He, he's got so many designations <laughs> now. He had to expand his his uh, his business card. It's it's, it's like it by, wraps to the eight, back. Yeah. It's like eight by ten now. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Folds in half. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, our our friend Don Freeman, who's been on the crypto podcast a few times with us, uh, his company uh, has a certification for financial advisors to learn about Bitcoin and blockchain. And right. so, I guess um, you tell me, what were your biggest takeaways from going through the process? So, you know, I've always been open to crypto, digital assets. Uh, in the past, I, I knew a little bit about it, but the designation, I think, just shed a lot of light on understanding more the genesis of blockchain, Bitcoin, and then also kind of uh, described other digital assets that are pretty prominent in the space. To me, though, um, you know, I was always just sort of iffy on whether it made sense to incorporate digital assets into a like a multi asset portfolio for clients on a broad scale. And I would say that there was a lot of takeaways, in my opinion, that they you know, provided that sort of made, you know, made it okay to, you know, to sort of start thinking about that. And, you know, you can have a small allocation in your portfolio, even at 1%, and it could still have a meaningful impact to your portfolio's return. And then also, I think it's, um, I need to do a little bit more research on this, but Bitcoin has had a lower correlation to equities over time. I think it's sort of trended um, a little bit more closely lately, but you know, even adding Bitcoin to your portfolio that can actually improve diversification benefits also. So um, up to a certain degree. So uh, to me, that was there was lots of examples that they covered uh, and then asset allocation, um, you know, tools and methods that um, that they show that got me more comfortable with that. And you know, also too, just we all know that Bitcoin can be very volatile, but just the explanation that, you know, upside volatility is also good and we like upside volatility. So just kind of some, some points like that, just to sort of help, um, you know, ease this uh, harshness around the asset class you might hear. Do you, um, so obviously you feel a little differently about crypto than when you, when you first started the process. I do. And, you know, I kind of already mentioned it, but uh, again, just sort of made me more comfortable thinking about it, you know, as part of a multi-asset portfolio, you know, you know, incorporating that into the portfolio. But, you know, I think also that kind of combined with the launch of the spot Bitcoin ETS because before I was just really hesitant on, there was a lot of compliance issues, um, you know, whether it's best execution, there's hundreds of exchanges out there, you know, where, where can you find the best one, um, you know, risk with, you know, potentially having wallets stolen uh, with clients and then just operational, um, complexity just from tracking your clients owning, um, 
digital assets directly. So the spot, the launch of the spot Bitcoin ETFs kind of eliminates all those issues. And so that in combination with taking this course and learning more about the asset class, I'm more comfortable considering it, you know, down the road to be part of our, to, or maybe not part of our, um, traditional model, but maybe adding a new model to incorporate that. Okay. Well, I know that's something that we've been stepping toward over the last couple of years, um, is, is learning more about this. I mean, it, this is the first new asset class that's been created in, they say, 150 years. What was, what was right. the asset class created 150 years ago? Oh, <laughs> Does anybody I think know? It was bonds. Oh, was it? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I always wondered, like, this is the first one in 150 years. Well, what was the other one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, one, no one alive then that dealt with that um, is around now. So right. it, it's functionally right. a new thing. Was it tulips or? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you think bonds is just a loan, but I guess as a bond itself Self, right that's what was right. created okay that makes so, sense so i'm curious mm -hmm. um if you don't mind saying so before you took the class on a scale of one to ten where would you have said your crypto education was at with 10 being expert level i would say like a three and okay. now maybe like a six and a half seven oh, wow so, okay so it was, it was very worthwhile then right it was yeah. it was a uh, you know i'd say it's a mile wide but like an inch deep it sure. just covered a broad base of topics and it really sort of focused on um you know incorporating it into your firm's practice and, and cover a lot of like different, um, whether it's compliance, um, uh, you know, updating ADV or, you know, operational situations. So that the track I did, there's several different tracks, but the advisor track actually touched on those different areas. Awesome. Mm -hmm. So Robert, um, before we start diving into, um, you know, alternative a asset classes and yep. what that, all that even means, yep. uh, let's do a quick, uh, kind of crypto update. What's happening with uh, what what is bitcoin at right now 60 71,000 wow um, yeah so when we talked to literally a month ago on the 27th of february it was at 56,000 so you 26% change I remember but when it's it been was like at 9 yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> but a lot of volatility in the last month we've been up to this level actually a little bit higher mm -hmm. um and then a drawdown that was about 15% and then kind of re ran back up um over the last literally 48 hours with so, massive inflows into the ETFs. E e ETFs. It's been incredible to watch. Like, you know, whether the issuers or the sponsors of these ETFs actually believed this and didn't say it, or they, they're also surprised. I would love to know, yeah. but you, you've seen, you know, the IBIT, the BlackRock ETF be the first ever, the fastest ever, excuse me, um, to 10 billion of AUM. They did it in, I think five weeks. Wow. Um, you know, for reference, I think the gold, um, GLD ETF took three years to get there. Yeah. I mean, obviously very different time. That was 20 years ago. Right. Um, but it's been fascinating. Um, you know, I think early on when these were right before they launched or right as they were launching the group of nine new um, products, because you have the grayscale one that kind of converted from a trust to become a 10th. Right. They um they thought the asset class of those new nine, or excuse me, the, the total AUM at the end of 2024 might be about 5 billion. Well, we are well past that. In one fund. In, in, yes, one, <laughs> one doubled it. So, you know, I've seen projections that it may be around 50 by the end of the year, um, which is pretty incredible. And uh, it's, you know, largely inbound interest. There's no like sales teams really out there trying to sell this to clients. And it sounds like it's retail, whether they're managing it themselves or they're calling their broker and saying, please put this in my account. So, right. Yeah. With the, um, you know, it, it, it's how much of a factor this is having the market, I think is hard to say, but it feels like it's having a big, big impact. You know, you don't have typically the kind of runs that we've seen in Bitcoin before a halving, which is about a month from now in late April. And, you know, you couple that with how the altcoin market is working. It normally hasn't run it like, like it has this early in the, in a bull market cycle for crypto. So you have all sorts of factors because you have the sellers of the Bitcoin. So the ETFs can be buying it. So some they're likely recycling their funds back into large cap um, altcoins is what it f seems to be right now. So, you know, it's you try to make a projection on what you think may happen to a certain asset. But, you know, you have to put a big asterisk on it right now because it's definitely acting differently. Did, did BlackRock cut their fee? I mean, I, I know that I guess you don't have to pay the expense ratio for yeah. the first six months. Um, but I thought their fee was like over 21 bips. And I, um, I looked at it yesterday and it was like 12 bips. I believe that they have an introductory. I don't know if it's up to a certain AUM or a certain time period because mm -hmm. some of them had played that game. Um, the only one that I know is cut their fee. And I believe it's down to zero or really functioning zero is the 
um, the one from Valkyrie that actually mm. had planned on shutting it down. I, I, I can't figure out what their strategy is, <laughs> um, it, it, but they have some inflows. So, you know, mm. I, I don't understand how 10 of these can exist. Um, at some point there's going to be some fee compression there. Right. Um, the, these are exceptionally low fees for crypto. We'll be very clear. I know for yeah. normal ETFs, these are high. Um, even you throw a grayscale out cause they're 150, right. Bips. <laughs> they're, they're different, but yeah, Grayscale's fees being in 150 bips is high. Um, when they were truly a trust, it was at 200. Um, so they did lower their fees. Um, and you can see a good amount of outflows. A large selling of the ETFs, or basically all the selling of the ETFs has come down to Grayscale. They've almost sold about half of their holdings. And they their, their investors in it have sold about half their, um, which was around 600,000 Bitcoin. So it was a huge holding. Part of it's coming from you know, bankruptcies of different creditors. There's a lot of different reasons why it's being sold and obviously fees are part of it. So it's, uh, I, I look forward to seeing that kind of tail off and kind of then really seeing what happens to the price. Cause you have, don't have that sell pressure. So, right. but the, um, you know, kind of on the topic of, um, creditors, you know, we'll kind of move down the list here. So Jim and I, um, was part of a lending. Well, Jim and I had a lending program that Genesis is the name of it. The names are really confusing and they had been going through it. And typically in crypto, when there's bankruptcies, like the FTX one that's going through, like, I believe we talked last month of how the FTX creditors would be getting back their asset. It was a notional dollar value, the same that they had at the day of bankruptcy. That's great. But the problem is crypto is Forex since then. So they they've lost out on that. In this case, the Genesis bankruptcy, they're actually getting back their tokens one for one for what they had. So they technically haven't lost anything besides the ability to sell in the meantime. So that was a first in crypto to kind of see, in my opinion, a bankruptcy held, uh, handled correctly when possible. Um, you know, that was not the case. It couldn't have been the case with the FTX one, but it was um, something that's, you know, I guess a good evolution of the industry. I feel like Sam's sitting in jail going. He's getting sentenced today or tomorrow. Is he? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, Cause um, I actually saw his mom wrote a letter to the court. She, she doesn't come across as a sympathetic parent or feel like he did much of anything wrong. Like <laughs> I'm not quite sure the letter's doing him any service. Cause she yeah. talks about all the things he was doing good for the world. Right. And about his philanthropy. No, no, he was giving away clients money. <laughs> That's not philanthropy. <laughs> I'm sure his uh, ex-girlfriend didn't write him a letter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Correct. Yes. So yeah, it's um, this, you know, we'll probably cover it maybe next but if month. If he hadn't had the crazy trades. He'd be, he'd be fine. Yeah, but... He just he, had to get through that that down period. Right. But, now, but he was still doing illegal things. They were gambling. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They were not investing. They were gambling. And yes. they didn't... There was no proper risk controls. And even from a corporate governance, there right. was, it was a mess. It needed to go away. and glad it did. So we could be in a better <laughs> spot today. So, um, you know, so JP Morgan recently announced uh, in the last week or so that... Bitcoin ETF holdings have now surpassed gold bullion, bullion holdings within client portfolios, which caught me off guard. I figured that number would be a lot higher for yeah. gold. Mm. And it was, um, I was like, wow, this thing is really like, a guy has put it right. in perspective. Uh, not, not that I had a good perspective on what gold was before, but like you just think generally higher, I would, in my mind at least. So. Yeah. I, I just, this is what I'll, I'll insert this comment. Um, what's the market cap of Bitcoin right now? Close to a trillion? Oh, it's I over think. a trillion. Um, okay. Cool. What's the market up. cap of, let's we'll, we'll say it's 1.5 it, trillion. It's 1.39. Okay. So 1.4 trillion. The market cap of the US dollar? Mm. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's a big number though. Yeah. But if you, if you have, if you have Bitcoin grow to the numbers that you think that they're going to grow to, or not you specifically, but just right. The they, industry. Yeah. They. <laughs> um, what happens when it surpasses the market cap of the U.S. dollar? What What are the consequences of that? I don't know that we have an answer for that, but yeah, I mean, it's certainly a psychological barrier. Um, I think there's other barriers along the way that would maybe help illustrate what might happen. People might think those kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, when it what because is the dollar I would assume be higher or lower than the U.S. stock market? Like there's yeah, I think uh, the others, dollar's higher than the right. stock market. So you get past, market cap. you know, you get past real estate. I mean, there's other barriers yeah. along the way. Right. Um, and the, the rate that the dollar is increasing, um, it's going to be a, it's hard to catch it. <laughs> well, even uh, the market cap of gold, I think it's, I just looked it up. Oh, yeah, 14, it's like, it's like 10x from yeah. where it's at now. Yeah, it's got a waste. Trillion. 
Yeah. That's the one that I've heard a little bit talked about. It's like, right. oh, when does Bitcoin pass gold? Is it this year? I'm like, yeah, but it, it is passes, not this year. If it pa- <laughs> no, not <laughs> this year. If it passes gold, I don't know. <laughs> who, who cares? Right, I mean, it's just no, no, no. the people a, that care are the the laser eyes, right? Um, Bitcoin people. Oh, oh, because because they are the digital gold. And oh, they, like, it, it is, it is. They are, yeah. they are climbing the mountain. I, I just, you know, I've had this question posed to me: What happens when Bitcoin surpasses market cap of the U.S. dollar? And does that mean that Bitcoin takes over the world, a one world currency? And I'm like, absolutely not. Mm-hmm. I don't see that because you can't really transact in Bitcoin. Correct. I mean, it's not it's not efficient at, from a transaction fee perspective, and yeah. there's. They're trying to make it that way with some other versions of Bitcoin, but it's a long ways off and they yeah. don't agree on anything, but just wanting the price to go up. So, <laughs> right. Right. It's, um, I don't foresee it happening personally. So yeah, yeah it's a, um, I don't know. So now, now I feel like it's become, you know, before we said, what is Bitcoin? It's, it's a store value. And now I feel like we, it's at one point we said, oh, well, definitely not storage oh. value. And then, but now it's starting to, mm-hmm. starting to make that case again, that it's, it's where you hold things. Right. I mean, you know, I've talked a little bit about this in the past about how crypto might follow the NASDAQ, maybe with a Forex multiplier on the volatility, but like it's used to be crypto would be, you might have a crypto weekend where it was like really hot and ran. That's kind of gone away. Like crypto follows the U S stock market hours because of the ETFs. That's and what that's only going to become yeah. more and more in sync in my opinion. Um, it, in some ways it takes the fun out of it, but also gives you some downtime in crypto, which is nice. <laughs> <Right>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, well so it's, I guess it's, it, ETFs have brought some stability to it. Mm-hmm. Looking at it that way too. Well then right. early asset classes have a lot of volatility. I guess yeah. maybe bonds back in the day had, um, you know, a lot more volatility than they do now, but that, that's mm-hmm. been an argument too, is just because it, it's an early asset class. And then, you know, as more institutional players come into the marketplace, that should just hope, you know, hopefully reduce the volatility there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, the second biggest crypto, Ethereum, has largely been flying somewhat underneath the radar so far this cycle. I mean, it's been, been kind of following the other large cap, even though it is certainly the biggest of the large cap, most um, big caps outside of Bitcoin. And, you know, we've I, I've kind of speculated in previous podcasts that I thought the last big lawsuit the SEC is going to file is against Ethereum in some form. I didn't realize I was going to be within a month of kind of the smoke starting to turn into potentially a little fire because it is now announced that the Ethereum Foundation is under investigation. I, I somewhat fear what this does to the industry um, because Ethereum is so far reaching. There's so many tokens that are on it. It is certainly the biggest platform for smart contracts. It's There's a, there's a lot of um, skeletons in this closet from everything that I've read. And I just wonder, is the SEC willing to open the Komodo here? Or are they willing to like do an investigation in air quotes and find something, a slap on the wrist to move on because the SEC could get implicated in this as well um, from the way that they handled this in 2018 by mm. not by calling it not a security when it actually was quite a security back then. And actually you can make a better case that it is a security today because of their move from proof of work to proof of stake. It's kind of getting in the weeds, but at the end of the day, um, it'd be interesting to just kind of see how this one unfolds. Is that why other blockchains have been getting more notoriety lately because of this lawsuit? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily tied to the lawsuit. Some other ones are doing some good marketing thing. I mean, Solana, Solana. is the one that comes to mind. It has had an amazing run um, from a price appreciation perspective. But I tell you what, like right now, the only thing that seems to be on Solana is a bunch of meme coins. <laughs> and it's like, and there's, there's bonk. <laughs> there's bonk and there's even like um, election theme meme coins. So there's, um, they spelled Trump wrong. They spelled Biden wrong. Uh, it, it and they have these funky logos. I mean, like it's this, it's a casino and you're just kind of, almost at a slot machine. That's kind of like um, cartoon based. It's, I don't know. It's not something that I necessarily participate in and follow all that much, but it's definitely been out mm-hmm. there. And, you know, for the, for the salon investors, good for them. They, you know, at some point they probably should ring the cash register on that one. <laughs> it's, um, um, actually one thing in my notes here that I should have mentioned when we we're talking about um, the uh, Bitcoin ETFs is, so iShares, the iBit, and the FBTC, which is the Fidelity one, have taken in cash on 49 consecutive days. This was prior to yesterday. I believe yesterday would have been the 50th. Um, that has only ever happened with 30 um, uh, ETFs ever. And it's, um, I think the longest one is something like 100 something. So like they're all well off the record at this point, but they are in uncharted territories and none of them have done an out of the gate at launch. So it's always been some period of time later. So 
just another way to kind of look at this thing to mm -hmm. see how big of a phenomenon it is so far been. And that's net inflows? Net inflows, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I guess the last thing that I will bring up is the news from yesterday is the SEC v, uh, v Ripple case um, is kind of making its way um, through the remediation phase. Um, and the SEC filed their um, suggestion, I guess you would call it. I mean, I'm sure there's a legal term for it about what the um, the, the courts should um, slap Ripple with. So they, there's already like a $700 million fine or up to $700 million fine for some portion of the case that the SEC thinks they should pay. This is, I think, the punitive side of it. And, the, and they're asking for $2 billion. It's more than Ripple ever made from the sale of their XRP to the institutional clients only. I, I don't know. It's never going to be close to that number. Um, obviously, this is a negotiation. They're going to start high. Ripple's going to be like, we think it should be zero um, or probably something close to zero. The vast majority of the sales that happened were outside the United States. So they were not really under the purview of the SEC, even though the SEC likes to think that they are. That's my read on the situation. We'll, we'll know in a month how Ripple feels because that's when their brief response to this is due. So maybe two podcasts from now, we'll have some bit of clarity. But this case seems to be wrapping up outside of an appeal by one of the sides. And, you know, for the most part, the industry, you know, at least crypto Twitter, I'll say this, has um, put this behind us. Um, obviously, it's still important to Ripple and the shareholders there, but it's um, something kind of bubbled up. It had been quiet since literally July for the most part. So. Thank you for that update. Yes. Um, so let's kind of dive into alternative investments. So when you think about stocks and bonds as your primary investments, and alternative investments are things like real estate, uh, crypto, which obviously we have covered uh, pretty thoroughly already today, um, private equity, uh, hedge funds, private credit. These are all things that are alternatives, including uh, collections, so it could be cars, paintings, watches even. Mm -hmm. um, there are people who invest in watches and call that an investment. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. don't know about pooled yeah. money for that. But um, so, you know, Missy, when she speaks at some of her conferences, she comes back or she'll text me while she's there. She's like, everyone's talking about alternative investments. Everyone's talking about alternative investments. And then Robert sends me this article about the new portfolio is 40 stock, 30 bonds, 30 alternative investments. And then I forward it to you guys and you guys are like, that's crazy. Who would put 30% of their money in <laughs> alternative investments? Um, so I, honestly, when you get to ultra uh, high net worth families, 30 plus million dollars in liquid assets, they have, um, they, they're gonna have probably private equity Maybe they've invested in a hedge fund. They probably have a real estate portfolio that they use themselves. Right. <laughs> that yes. are part that are all part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, we're not really talking about those families necessarily. Should they be doing any of these things? It's really more of everyday investors because, in some sense, as humans, we all inspire to have more. Right. Especially Americans, we all want to have more, 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 more. And in your Facebook feed, um, you'll probably start seeing. Uh, things for buying commercial real estate, you, you know, it's almost like crowdfunding type type investments. Uh, I saw one for paintings, invest in paintings, they yep. say, right, it's the new way of the future. And, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's private art. Um, and how you do that, by the way, is you buy up a lot of paintings, you put them in a warehouse, mm -hmm. you don't hang them anywhere. Right. They're all sitting in a warehouse, you document what you have, and you wait 20 years, and maybe somebody died. <laughs> Something in your warehouse is worth money. That's how they do it, right? That's how the average rich person does it. I've read recently about how the ultra wealthy do this. Um, yeah. So they will get a painting. They'll have an appraiser appraise it for some crazy high value. Then they'll gift it to a museum. Uh, and then they get the tax oh, write-off. Uh, but yeah. it's pro it, th those dollars never were created. Never. But they, yeah. but they get the tax write-off for it. So oh, wow. It's a, a fascinating world of um, <laughs> right. the IRS would probably like to shut that down, but that's currently yeah. the way that works. Right. Are you curious why annuities keep coming up as a potential investment option? People are often told that annuities can effectively mitigate investment risks and help secure their financial future. However, annuities often benefit the salesperson and might not be the best choice for you as a consumer. To learn more about the various types of annuities, the negatives of owning them, and better investment alternatives, we have a free ebook on our website just for you. To download our ebook, 
buyer beware, why do they keep trying to sell you that annuity? Simply click the link in the episode notes or visit wiserinvestor.com slash guides. Now let's get back to the episode. So anyway, how much is this, is, 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 should we, we really be focused on? And I think first of all, we need to kind of define some things. So real estate versus crypto, man, those are two different, those are two different things. Like how do you compare that? But that that's, they're both in the alternate investment asset class. Yeah. I mean, I, and I would say, you know, public real estate where you can just buy an ETF or maybe a mutual fund that captures the um, you know underlying companies, whether it's REITs or, um, you know, I guess uh, like, you know, different types of REITs in, in that space or, uh, you know, private real estate um, where, you know, you may be a sponsor is raising capital to invest in like properties or, you know, different types of sectors like multifamily or office. So there's, there's lots of different types of real estate in general, um, you know, versus crypto, I, I think, there's obviously some differences there. Usually real estate, there's a cash flow component, um, you know, whether it's, um, you know, inflows to so say multifamily, um, you know, paying, paying down rent and, and cash flows are paid back to the investors or for public real estate, there's dividend yields, uh, crypto, unless you're staking, um, you know, and earning some yield on lending your assets, um, you're not generally going to get, um, some sort of cash flow component to that. So obviously, there's differences there, uh, differences in the, in the type of investment, um, cost of ownership, cost of ownership, one, right? Big difference in liquidity too, right? Liquidity, yeah. time to liquidity. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, th there's obviously different risk, um, and, and benefits there, but so the benefits of alternatives in your portfolio in general are, are, are typically what? Like, why would wouldn't anybody invest? Mm -hmm. So to, to create the list, hedge funds, private equity, uh, investments, uh, private credit, which is look at as loans, like private loans, uh, yeah. more structured than giving your loan to your cousin, <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but, uh, obviously the crypto. And then we have traditional real estate mm -hmm. holdings. Why, why do people have these outside of stocks? Yeah. So, you know, for the private investments, private credit, equity, and real estate in general, um, you know, these, uh, investors like these investments because they're, there's a liquidity return premium associated with that. And that's because uh, these investments are typically locked up and they're not um, subject to just say, for instance, like a mutual fund an, an equity mutual fund. When there's a significant market drawdown, usually investors flood to pull, you know, redeem their money out of these funds and uh, the managers have to sell assets at uh, favorable prices. And so when you invest in these illiquid locked up funds, uh, managers don't have to do that and they're not able to sell uh, assets at, um, you know, unattractive prices. So there's this Ill liquidity return premium associated with um, these type of investment vehicles. Uh, also to just, you know, although it's kind of hard to, to analyze, there's uh, diversification benefits from uh, these asset classes, you know, even private equity and traditional uh, equity, uh, there's, uh, they're not as correlated. They're not perfectly uh, correlated, um, but it's kind of hard to track that. There's also diver diversification benefits with, um, you know, investing in different types of market segments that you can't get traditionally, um, you know, with private credit. Uh, these are small to mid-sized companies accessing that need capital fast and they can't get this capital from banks um, or le leverage loan or, or they don't want to from the leverage loan or high yield markets. Um, so there's, there's usually a, um, higher return, you know, higher yield associated with that because they want the capital. Now they need it to, you know, just say a business needs cash, you know, working capital to keep their business afloat. Um, so, and, and this actually kind of the genesis of this came out of the great financial crisis where there was a lot more regulations on banks. Um, and you know, these companies needed capital to access capital quickly. Uh, so this market sort of exploded in recent years because of this, um, but because you talking about also in general or sorry, or this is more like private credit, private credit. Yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just, um, diversification, diversification benefits, and then also, uh, a return premium associated, um, versus traditional, um, investments. So when you think about the drawbacks of, you know, well, first of all, let's define private, that's private credit. So what about private equity versus hedge funds? Think about, what private equity does versus what a hedge fund does. 
Yeah, private equity is you know sort of similar to private credit. They're you know they're pulling money, um, but they're investing this capital into businesses to so whether to take over the business or it's a strategic investment to save the business. Um, and you know obviously these aren't publicly traded companies, uh, so it's um, getting and, access to companies that are right. publicly traded that hopefully have a higher rate of return. Right, because your private equity fund is coming in to buy a company to grow it or merge it with other companies right. inside their portfolio. Yeah, they create synergies, whether it's cost cut cutting, um, you know, reducing workforce, um, you know, cre creating oper operational efficiencies there, and then looking to bring it back to market at some place. Um, you know, whether it's the public market or it's selling to another private equity buyer at a higher multiple that they bought it for. And then the hedge fund does what? So hedge fund, there's lots of different types of strategies, but I guess, you know, in a nutshell, hedge fund is, um, you know, hedging your risk in certain different ways. So, you, you know, I think the most common hedge fund that everyone would, type of strategy that everyone knows is long short. So basically you're, you know, you're long, like public equity buy the stocks, stock. but then mm -hmm. you're also uh, shorting stocks on the, on the other side to reduce your market exposure. And, and that way, by doing that, there's, well, for one, more opportunities, uh, you know, the investment universe is bigger. You're reducing your market risk, but you're also trying to um, find companies uh, that can reduce or increase your risk adjusted return by doing that. So you're really hedging out your risk in some sort of way, but there, there's a lot of different types of hedge funds uh, out there. It's amazing with hedge funds is I've, I've never quite understood why people would invest in a hedge fund. The perfect hedge is the short term treasuries, right? So why, why wouldn't you just buy short-term treasury? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think if, if you're the, trying not to lose yeah. money, right? The main, the main thing is because hedge funds aren't going to give you crazy high returns, right? No, I mean, they're usually, I think a lot of times it's like a market neutral fund. You're trying to have zero beta or zero exposure to the market. Um, so, I mean, from a diver, diversification standpoint, it can reduce your overall portfolio's risk adjusted return by incorporating that allocation there. Or just buy short-term treasuries. <laughs> you could do that, right. um, but you're also exposed to like credit risk and of the U.S. I mean, government. Yes, yeah, and um, <laughs> you know, I guess it's not as much, but short term, you know, interest rate risk to some degree. But yeah, true. Um, but if you're buying three month treasuries, I, I don't know. I've just we've we've looked at the, into this before, um, and I'm just like, why? Why would you spend two three yeah. percent in fees and lock your money up for? <laughs> for yeah. the, for the long, and you don't know what's in it. Like right, they don't right. tell you. Yeah. yeah. It's a black box usually. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I was recently listening to a podcast. Um, everyone thinks of Warren Buffett as the best investor ever. Um, and he's certainly up there, but the, there's a private fund, um, that no longer takes outside capital because they've been so good with, um, growing it themselves as Renaissance technologies. Mm -hmm. I think it's something like 67% yearly returns compounded since 1985. Oh right. wow! Like, and they're like a black box. Yes, you have no idea box. what what's in that. Employees sign a. It's like all a pot. Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our Bitcoin em, employees. Sign, <laughs> yes. It's true. Employees it, are signing it, like a uh, lifelong NDA. Like, there's a ton of secrecy around right. it, but like, yeah. it's pretty fascinating from what I've learned so far. So, you invest in it, you don't know mm -hmm. what's in it. It's made sixty seven percent a year, and it's all paper returns. This sounds like Madoff, right? <laughs> I was right. About to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have no online access yes <laughs> yeah. oh goodness yeah. um all right so so that explains that uh let, let, we forgot to add one more let's talk about commodities for a second um uh, commodities are definitely an alternative asset class so you've you've got um you think oil automatically when you think about commodities and gold right. um you know then the next thing would be like in my mind is forestry right but then yep. you still have chickens and Timber. cows and yeah. <laughs> right. all the other stuff. Food. Fall, food, yeah. All things that fall into a commodity. You can buy mm -hmm. uh, uh, ETFs that represent the commodities right. market. Um, commodities, there is there is the commodity, the futures market, right? Um, you'd be really careful that you don't screw that up or else mm -hmm. you're going to have cows and oil delivered to your front door. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> so typically it's safer for everyday yeah. people to not trade on right. the futures market okay. and, and simply to... Yep by the ETF, right? <laughs> uh, no, I will say we incorporated commodities for a long time. I've been doing this for 24 years. And many years ago, I, I was like, you know what? This is not a long-term long -term healthy yeah. asset class. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're not making money here. It's more Why of a we trade. It? Yeah. yeah. And, and so the, really the only time you wanted to own it was the year of 2022 so, thus yeah. far. Yeah. I mean, 
I've always understood the commodities one to be highly manipulated by because the government spends a lot of money to farmers to plow stuff back in the ground if they want to manipulate the price. Like, <laughs> right. I, do I want to be fighting against the government when I'm making a trade? Probably not. <laughs> probably, yeah, probably not. Yeah. Uh, then we get done. We talked about this a little bit earlier, but um, collectibles, you know, issues there, obviously high fees, um, the amount of money you're paying out. It's kind of an unproven process on, on collectibles. It's kind of like a house. I feel like your primary home is never like an investment. I mean, yes, it could go up in value, but you don't build or pick out the colors of your home based on the market and what the market might want. Right. And you do what right. you like. So, you know, but after that, yes, we, you should be buying things mostly with a spreadsheet and say, yes, <laughs> this is a good investment. This is not a good investment. Um, structured, uh, structured products. You want to define that one a little bit? Yeah. I, I mean, there's a lot of different offerings out in the marketplace, but you know, I think generally structured products, um, it's a, a basket of underlying securities that a, a bank will create a note and then syndicate it out. Um, you know, I think really there's only a few reasons why investors would be attracted to this. And I think it's mostly because of optics, which is not really a good reason. You know, a lot of times clients that are a little bit nervous about investing in the marketplace, um, you know, they think the market's near top, um, you know, this with a quote unquote guaranteed return with a downside protection, uh, you know, this seems it's, somewhat, it's like a CD almost It has, so we'll give you 5%. Right. Or, but your upside's capped, but and, your upside's yeah. capped. Sounds yeah. like an annuity too, or an index yeah. annuity could be another one. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there, there's origination fee. There's some, probably some sort of, um, you know, management fee spread that they're, that yeah. they're taking, but there uh, are CDs for a while issued by, big banks that would give you whatever the S and P did up to 6%, right. but you're guaranteed never to lose money. Hmm. Um, that, that was really big. I saw some of that during, during COVID, but during the financial crisis is when I saw it the most. Yeah. And I know if you have the capital, um, you, you can work with like Goldman you, or you lost big time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, that's the main risk is, I mean, we've seen what the market's done over the past 10 years, the SP 500. And if you were capped at 6%, I mean, you're losing out on a lot of potential return. And you know, the other positive too, is a lot of times they do have this downside protection. Yeah. I think not, not a ton of them, but and it all depends. Like you might, you might have a 5% return, um, hundred percent downside protection. I've seen a lot where it's like 20% downside protection, but then again, your, your return might be capped at like seven or something. So, right. um, but yeah, I mean, again, upside is capped. You don't receive the dividend yield on the underlying basket. You don't own those holdings. Um, you know, you, you physically don't own if those. the bank goes out of business, you're screwed. Right. Yeah. I mean, we are, we're talking about like JP Morgan, <laughs> Goldman Sachs city, but, yeah. but still there's, there's credit risk there as well. That should <clears throat> layman. Yeah. Lehman. <laughs> Bear Stearns. Yeah. Bear Stearns. Right. Cough, cough. So yeah, <laughs> it can happen. Right. You know? Um, yeah, that's true. So here's, here's kind of my take. So crypto, uh, instantly priced commodities, instantly priced. We know what those prices are. They move, um, 24 seven pretty much. Right. Uh, private equity, hedge funds, especially hedge funds, um, structured products, uh, real estate for the, but not held individually, like held in a yes. fund of some sort. Right. You don't know what the price is. They value the, their assets typically once a year. Sometimes so, quarterly, but so yeah. But so I feel like it's somewhat sense of a, uh, it's a false sense of security at times, because if you have years like 2022, the market's down and they go, but this private equity fund, it was, it held on. It didn't go yeah. down the whole time. Well, cause they delayed their valuations cause they didn't want to have to yeah. do markdowns. Correct. Yeah. So there were markdowns. The price did come down and maybe the price went back up, mm -hmm. but your statement says a dollar, you put in a dollar, right. you it's, still have a dollar, but that's right. not, that's not true. So I feel like it, you know, the reason, the compelling reason to add this to client portfolios is, and we can do anything. We, we have access to Goldman Sachs private bank here. We can do more than what the Goldman guy can do at Wiser Wealth Management, right? We have the full asset to the full basket, right? Mm -hmm. But why do we use more of those products? It's, you know, high fees. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's a bit of smoke and mirrors. Now, this is not just, I'm not saying this is Goldman. It's just the nature of the product period yeah. is it can bring a sense of mm -hmm. security. Now it does bring diversification because maybe this one fund manager is really good at picking out these private companies and growing these companies. Mm -hmm. 
But there's also different phases of that. You can get a company that's just beginning. Nobody really wants to invest in that. Those are called angel angel investor, right? right? Super right. risky. Yeah. So so typically you're picking up uh, these private equity funds or picking up companies that are you know well past the first, second, third, fourth, fifth mm-hmm. round. They're maturing as right. companies, maybe mm-hmm. even buying out the founders at this point, right? Yeah, absolutely. So 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 it, it, to me, it's it's um, all right. Look, if you if, if you're sitting on ten million dollars, you want to take five hundred thousand of that. And, and, and invest in individual companies hoping to hit it big with a with another company that, to me that makes sense but it, it doesn't make sense to be putting 30 percent of your money your net worth mm-hmm. into such strategies yeah. that's like endowments or as you said earlier ultra high net worth investors yeah. that have all this cash flow coming in they need to put something to work right well, and they have and, like a, and, and a longer horizon too yeah right? like correct. you're horizon. not putting something in a product like a lot of the vc funds are you know you, your money's locked for five or seven years. Like yeah, you're right. in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So oh, it, or longer. Yeah. Yeah. We're right. 20 years. Yes. Yeah. So, so it's, I mean, it can be challenging. Robert, you, you and I both have created companies. Mm-hmm. You're a couple steps ahead of me. You've already okay. liquidated. You sold the private equity. Sure. And now you're, you're moving on. You're running another, yeah. another startup. Yep. But th- the point is, is that you put all your eggs in one basket at one point. Right. right, you get, and you so get as business owners, we allocated. understand that. Yes, we understand that. But when you when you're managing other people's money, who worked mm-hmm. the nine to five, had a great corporate career, maybe they held company stock, and maybe their future was based on their participation in that one company. Mm-hmm. I just have a hard time believing that we would take thirty percent of their net the, worth. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and lock it there's away. There's nothing wrong with equity. the strategy that they employed their whole career. Absolutely it's not. It's purely like it's normal. The, <laughs> the risk tolerance is going to be very different, right? Yes. I, um, not to say one is better than the other, but it's just a different path and you have to understand who you're talking to. Yeah, sure. absolutely. Well, and also I would say, you know, to say a client that has 500,000 in assets, 30% of that, what, 150? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, what are you gonna do with that? Yeah, and, and most <laughs> private alternative investments, it's usually a two hundred fifty thousand dollars minimum. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that would be at least half of their, you know, investable right. assets. Yeah, I, I'd say if your net worth is 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 under five million, mm-hmm. that you probably shouldn't be messing with, yeah. right, with pr- the, yeah. the 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 private equity hedge fund stuff. It, and I'll do my obligatory um, crypto plug here. I think over the next say five years, you start to be able to fractionalize or tokenize a lot of these funds mm-hmm. to make it operationally efficient. The SEC's got to get around to making the, the credit investor rule a little bit, little bit different to right. allow more people access to this. Yeah, but it would allow more people into this kind of asset class where mm-hmm. a lot of times they're, you know, if they're not accredited, they're not allowed in. So now and, there there are ETFs out there that replicate all of this. Absolutely. So anybody can mm-hmm. buy an ETF and put one percent, two percent, five percent of their money in there. And that's something that we've looked at in, in the years past, and it it just didn't have the rate of return. Like nothing beats the S and P 500. And that's like, because at a market <laughs> drawdown, everything goes correlations go to go one, one basically. Um, yeah. so that, you know, these managers are selling assets and, um, again, so I mean, that's where that illiquidity premium comes into play. Now I feel like that you know, we're, we're talking about private equity in this case. Um, now I feel like with Bitcoin, that's scalable for almost anybody. You could put 1%, 2%, 3% in anybody's portfolio now with the Bitcoin ETF, and you now have access to that type of possibly outsized return. Right. It's right. Bitcoin for the people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, it's uh, it'll be fascinating to kind of see that part evolve because like as other ETFs or crypto come on, like how that shifts the market. Do you see yeah. a drawdown in Bitcoin because you want to go to the Ethereum or XYZ one that comes right. along? Um, uh, I, time I, will I tell. totally see in the future there's going to be ETF that has like market cap weighted coins. As there it. should yeah. be. Yeah. yeah. Wisdom Tree, I don't know if they have a trademark on it, but they already have an index that does yeah. that. There should be an SPY of crypto. Yes. Um, but we're so far away from that right <laughs> yeah, now. Correct. It's not even fun to think about. Well, we right. need the SEC to finish their version of cleaning house. Uh, yes. And once they're done doing that, <laughs> right. it'll be safe to do that. Yes. But but uh, who, who, who asked for the Ethereum uh, ETF already? Someone asked for the um, Ethereum ETF. BlackRock has filed one and they already got it denied once. Okay. Um, I believe Bitwise has got one floating around out there. There's, I think, three or four of them. Um, they're so not that, that would press. be your next ETF that that's seventy percent Bitcoin, thirty yeah. percent Ethereum, or something like that. Right. right. You know, and if you um, kind of follow along the same process, um, you hear you heard a lot of chatter um, around the Bitcoin one with like certain dates upcoming. Um, the next big date for the Ethereum one is sometime in May. I forget who's. I think there's a couple of applications on that same date. Well, they can't do that and sue them um, at the same time, right? <laughs> 
you know, the SEC does a lot of weird things, so never say never. <laughs> going to approve an ETF yeah, yeah, yeah. and also sue them. I mean, the, the, the courts effectively told um, the SEC to approve the Bitcoin one. That's how that went uh, down. That's yeah. true. There's no court case right now that would do that. Well, you have um, to apply enough, evidently, and then sue them. Apply to enough win. and, you know, catch them on a good day, I guess. Right. Can we track the digital asset flows of the Congress, of the Congress members? Like, uh, is there a way you can, like, we can't have oh, stocks? Yeah. They have to disclose it, right? Yeah. Um, above a certain could. level or something. Yeah. yeah so maybe. Um, I don't know of many Congress, um, you know, people that, um, have much crypto holdings. I, we're, I think S- Senator Loomis from Wyoming has certainly got some Bitcoin. We're going to do a podcast pretty soon on invest stock tracker, <laughs> invest, invest like a Congress person, Congress person, again, we're going to Pelosi tracker yeah, yeah, and go through like all the holdings and, and back, back test it. But supposedly Nancy Pelosi has like, the she has an amazing return. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so anyway, you could also do this with commodities. You can do this with gold. You, you can do these all these things inside a portfolio, but it should never be um, just a crazy percentage, like like thirty percent. Right. It, it goes back to, I think people think that there's a secret sauce to investing that wealthy people make more money because they understand it. But, but yeah, and in, 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 in reality, is I don't think that's the case at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, wealthy people do make more dollars because if you have a million, a hundred million dollars, mm-hmm. and you make ten percent, <laughs> right, you're right. going to make more than most mm-hmm. people. Most people have in their portfolios, right? But but honestly, the 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 secret to success, I think, is keeping a simple allocation, but then at the same time understanding volatility and not right. doing this market timing. Wealthy people don't market time. No. Yeah. They don't. They have enough cash that they can get through periods of time yeah. in the market. Cash and uh, you know opportunistic cash, right? They see long, okay, there's a dislocation here. Yeah. Like I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, but they're not trying to trade their portfolio all the time for sure. Right. So I, I just don't know that. I, I think there's, a room, there's room for alternatives in a portfolio that makes sense to me. But I don't know that it's a 30%, even 15% allocation. Yeah. And, and you disagree with that? I don't disagree. I mean, I think... The case could be made from for ten to fifteen. Uh, again, it depends on and what though of all the things that we talked about. Well, I mean, you could you could bucket <laughs> it. I mean, if you if you have access to like three percent each. Well, you're not well, going to buy a hedge fund or a private no, equity three percent. But you know, I, I would say from my experience, you know, and again, this comes down to the due diligence, and you have to have a, a good team in place that can source these the high quality managers and on the best of investments, and even like within private equity, there's various sub asset classes that are difficult to kind of pinpoint. And, you know, I think overall private equity has done, um, the best it's, it's garnered a three to 4% return premium over the SP 500 over the long term. But again, it's, it's finding those managers and, and being right. able to, yes, that's the say. hard part. Yeah. yeah. Deal flow. Just yeah. because it says yeah. private equity doesn't mean you're going to beat the S and P 500 by three or four percent. You have to find right. the person, person. Right. who beats yeah. the S and P 500 by three or four percent. It takes a lot of resources to, yeah. to to do that. I don't know. I mean, I know that's per year, but at the same time, I'm like, oh, is that is that my risk premium? Like, is is only three to four percent? I mean, if the S and P 500 is uh, returning twenty six percent like last year, then maybe. But um, yeah, well. Yeah. yeah, well, I don't know if I got twenty six percent return. Do I? Am I really going after a thirty percent rate return? The risk yeah. is certainly higher. True. The risk is higher on yeah. private yeah. equity. You could lose everything. And you know, in admittedly, private equity's gotten a good rap the last ten years, five to ten years, because they've been largely keeping companies private longer. They're not going to the public markets where you'd have had IPO exposure, mm-hmm. yeah, and had the big pops because you're not seeing that much anymore. Or the opposite. Right. I mean, they're seeing a lot of contraction. Absolutely. I mean, outside of the Reddit one last week that did well because they kind of did a different path. Yeah. um, You're seeing, you know, a lot of that value accretion be Mm -hmm. um, within private market still. Well, that's all we have, Andrew. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What what we we always look and, 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 and you know, looking for the next, the next nut that Mm -hmm. looks a little better than the last nut. And, and, and the reality is, is that, you know, our portfolios for the most part are are pretty straightforward. I mean, we, we do carry VGT, which we were fortunate is, uh, has such a large NVIDIA holding that it's really um, had an outsized return the last right. last year or so. Um, and, and to me, that's, I, I bet on technology any day, you know, maybe there's a private equity fund that only buys in the tech space. Oh, right. Yeah, there's private credit <laughs> funds that focus. And I think a lot of them are skewed more to that that sector. Which which Currently, makes sense. Yeah. Solving problems and software, things of that nature. Yeah. Um, 
but I, I don't think that the future is going to be 40, 30, 30. I don't know that. I mean, you do talk to younger people that have everything in, in crypto mm -hmm. or they're trying to do these, these buy these paintings online through a Facebook ad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you do see those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah. it's more of get rich overnight kind of thing. Right. I don't feel like it's uh I don't feel like they think the S and P five hundred is dead or anything like that. Yeah, I, you know, Andrew and I were talking about this briefly beforehand. Like I've got this theory that like the younger crowd, so the millennials, are are they want to buy real estate. They probably in some cases can't afford it. So they may be seeking ways to try to quote quote unquote catch up. So they're in riskier things like a crypto. They yeah. may hit it right and maybe get they get lucky in that sense, but they um you know, they may not trust other parts of the um, other alternatives. So it's a uh, interesting mix. And as that plays out, as the, the wealth transfer happens, like it could be exasperated there and like, maybe they can afford real estate, but maybe they continue yeah. their gambling habits. Um, <laughs> right. So the next 10 years could be pretty interesting. Yeah. So. yeah it, well, for that younger generation, I, I think for established wealthy families, um, yeah, I love seeing about outside their home, about 30%, 33% of their assets inside real estate that they use mm -hmm. or they could have it a rental program for experiences mm -hmm. with family. Yes. Absolutely. So you're building legacy and wealth at the same time. So I'm talking about the beach house, lake house, mountain place, place out West, whatever it is that you want to do, you're, you're building your legacy with your family there. And then in addition to that, you're, you should have good price appreciation or you can rent it out for $12,000 a week. Mm -hmm. Right. That that's, that's the caliber of property that, that I like to see inside people's portfolios, which, you know, plug for wiser, <laughs> which is why for those families that are doing this, we, we charge a flat fee, mm -hmm. not a assets under management fee. So when you charge a flat retainer, um, to, for handling those assets plus, uh, in, investments and in planning, planning overall, um, that's a much better deal because you can make those recommendations without a conflict of interest mm -hmm. right. where most advisors are losing, Anytime you do a withdrawal, you're losing revenue. Right. Therefore, mm -hmm. they're not going to encourage people to make those decisions. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, we've got a couple of other episodes you might want to see episode or listen to. Uh, 206, the, our last uh, podcast, uh, Bitcoin ETF launch update. Uh, episode 208, direct indexing benefits and how it benefits high net worth individuals. Uh, episode 195, is a 60, 60 40 portfolio really dead? Um, answer is no, it'll never die. That's the best portfolio. <laughs> spoiler, spoiler, <laughs> spoiler. Alert. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening to today's episode. If you're interested in learning more about wiser wealth management, you can schedule a consultation to meet with one of our fiduciary financial advisors online. Uh, you can also click on the episode episode notes. You also find a link to um, Teton Crypto Capital if you'd like to get in touch with Robert uh, about investing in his fund. Thanks, guys. Enjoyed it. Thanks, Casey. Take care. Thanks for listening to a Wiser Retirement Podcast. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. Make sure to subscribe wherever you're listening. That way you don't miss any new episodes. We'd also appreciate if you could leave a rating and review. If you have any questions about anything that was discussed today, head to wiserinvestor.com and reach out. This episode was produced by Edward Resendez. 